you know, in reading it, there's personal, um, there's points in the book where you're very personal about your own kind of, like, I think it was in maybe the first chapter earlier on, you're talking about the scale of the global crisis, and then you're talking about where you live um, and, you know, becoming more attuned to the life that lives there, that is embodied in the land, that is part of the ecosystems. Um, and this sort of feeling that I get from you is that in pursuing this subject uh, through this book, and I'm sure just in everyday life, that in many ways you're, you're, you're describing something that's common in the work I do and discussing, um, it's been described as animism or this sort of view of all things contain consciousness and life. Like there's a genuine respect and reciprocal relationship with all living beings, <clears throat> even things that don't fit under the definition of being alive mm -hmm. under the kind of Cartesian or, or Western reductionist view. So you look at a, a river, a lake, um, a forest that is a living being um, and is deserving of of existing in a reciprocal relationship. And so when we think of like food sovereignty, as you describe it, um, people are recognizing and have already recognized many of these people are like, we've known this forever, that human beings are ecological beings. We don't exist in sep – we're not separate from the land. We're not separate from these living systems. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is trying to further integrate ourselves into these systems that due to the legacy of colonialism, neoliberal capitalism, and so on, has attempted to create separations and barriers between us and that living system and has impoverished yeah. both the living systems and us if we were to Absolutely. think of us as separate beings, separate um, categories. So I, I would like to talk about how food sovereignty fits into this act of resistance because I think when we think of resistance, you know, there are obviously direct confrontations with uh, state forces like the police or militaries or there's direct confrontation with, you know, uh, industries that are trying to extract minerals and resources, so-called resources and, uh, you know, fossil fuels out of the ground. There's direct confrontation with those entities. But there's things like learning how to grow a garden and how to regenerate the soil, right? Um, that is as much, if not more, part of it than anything else. So I would like to ask about food sovereignty and how that fits into this kind of uh, these resistance movements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'll just say that I, I prefer the term food autonomy, food autonomy, but I'll go back and forth between the two. Um, okay because food sovereignty is more widely used and most mm -hmm. of the things that are referred to or that refer to themselves as like projects seeking food sovereignty are super valid, they're great. It's just a more easily co-optable term mm -hmm. because it, um, it's more easy to, to take it as like a, a property of the nation state and mm -hmm. to be integrated into uh, like, you know, progressive politics that, um, you know, that, that, that are very limiting uh, or damaging in in other ways. So I think food autonomy is is interesting because it it you know spells out that like you know the the people you know growing and eating the food like you know need to have like the control of like you know defining how that happens and what that looks like. Whereas like sovereignty is is historically a word related to like the rights of a state, um, which is you know problematic and reflective of the ways that progressives usually don't think think much about like history and 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 words, mm -hmm. but also, like, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to like split hairs. Uh, the vast majority <laughs> of projects that are yeah. like described as food sovereignty are like great, wonderful projects. And so we just do need mm -hmm. to be aware of like politicians trying to, um, you know, like uh, limit how far we're going with that. Right. So um, food sovereignty is, is, is really, really powerful as a practice or food autonomy because it reminds us that we are living things. And, and so you pointed out like, like um, I mean, I, I think you, you pointed out both sides of this, but like, it, it's easy to focus on the, um, like the sort of anthropocentrism or human supremacy, which is ultimately and historically white supremacist because like, you know, what, what gets defined as human and like, what are the mm -hmm. characteristics of being human are you know, like that definition is under the control of these, you know, historically colonial, colonialist white supremacist institutions. And, and whenever you have like, uh, you know, like an in-group and an excluded other, there's always going to be like a great act of violence 
uh, against the people, against the beings who are like at the margins and who are like, you know, kind of in the borderland between like the, mm-hmm. the self and the other. So, so that's, that's really dangerous. And it's really important to look at the ways that um, the, I don't know what to call it, like, you know, Western society or, or like, you know, this, this kind of, you know, colonial dominant capitalist society has really, really like demeaned and demanded, uh, demeaned and damaged um, other life forms, other, other, you know, just like other, other forms of life, other, you know, animals, plants and, and all that but also the way that they impoverish us by like taking us, trying to take us out of nature, which is of course an impossible project, but mm-hmm. it's one that, you know, they, they cause a lot of damage in attempting. So by focusing on food, we're reminding ourselves that, you know, Oh, that's right. Like we need to eat, like we're living beings and we only exist. We only live through our relationship with other living beings and like eating and being eaten. That's like a very important relationship, growing, fertilizing, cultivating. These are all super important relationships. And so on, like to start on, I mean, you know, we could just like directly call like a spiritual level. I know like a lot of especially white people are uncomfortable with that, but like, yeah. um, I, you know, I think that's like a kind of silly discomfort. Yeah. Um, we, we, it's really, really important to remind ourselves that, that our survival is on the line at a much, much, much deeper level of like, you know, oh, will we die in the future because of climate change? But our survival is on the line because like, we have been tricked into forgetting that we are living beings and that we live through and with other living beings. So that's really, really vital. Um, second, we can totally dynamite the, 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 the division between like, you know, um, productive or constructive or, or creative struggles and destructive ones, because in order to grow food or in order to have like food, uh, you know, um, you know, not all food is grown, but like, in, in order to, to feed ourselves, we need to be able to have access to the land. Mm-hmm. And the land is subjected to capitalist regimes of property. So that's mm-hmm. illegal to do that. So we actually, like, we will directly put ourselves in conflict with a, a central movement of, of this cacophonous capitalist symphony, which is like just like wrecking the planet, when we try to feed ourselves uh, outside of a capitalist market and against the capitalist market. And a lot of the most powerful struggles around the world come from when people, as a matter of survival, insist on planting gardens, in you know, taking over abandoned lots and then defending those. Or yeah. in, you know, not leaving the forest that they've grown up in, but staying there and fighting back against both the environmentalist NGOs that want to turn the forest into like a nature preserve and, you know, the logging companies and, um, you know, or, you know, tourism companies that, you know, want to bring uh, disenchanted, yeah. you know, people from the global north on their, like their, you know, jungle holiday or something like that. So like mm-hmm. the, yeah, I, I think that we really need to do away with like that dichotomy between um, like attacking the system and like, you know, healing ourselves, building things up. Uh, we definitely need to like give pay a lot more attention to like activities of, of of like healing and care and 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 the relationships behind it all because um i think we're very much like trained to to devalue that uh, as both okay. part of like um like you know patriarchal uh, socialization and also because of the way that capitalism trains us to see the world as like a collection of objects rather than as like the relationships between mm-hmm. all these different living things um yeah so there's um, i'm sorry if i'm like you know being more abstract but but i think no, like fine. the way that we even begin to conceive of the notion of food uh mm-hmm. has to change at least you know when i say that like you know we you know people should you know self-identify or not like freely depending on like you know the circumstances that they were brought in and up in and the things that, that they were taught but i think that that these are like misconceptions around food and survival that are going to be pretty common at the very least like among among white people and probably like a lot of other people also like brought up in the in the global north or like post-colonized people who are like no longer part of like a, like a, like an indigenous community that is like still surviving outside of and against um colonialism right yeah it just seems like um when it does come you know, a lot of it comes back to food and it just seems like this obviously food is so integral to survival so how we our relationship with food, how it's produced, um, really 
I mean, it, I don't know how else to say it. It's just incredibly central. And it seems like once you begin to engage directly with that subject and with that reality, the material reality of what food is, then it, it really, it, one, it, it connects you to the land itself, all of its complexity. Um, it connects you to community. It also, once you really begin to engage with it seriously, it seems based in what I'm reading in your book and in this discussion is that it, it it forces people to directly confront a system that does not want them to have any sort of, we can say sovereignty or autonomy um, over their own ability to feed themselves. Yes. That is a much more concise way to put it. You should, you should delete my answer and, uh, <laughs> and, the do that. and just, and just uh, putting it somewhere. That is, that's what I do I'm is I listen and then I'm like, okay, <laughs> how do I concisely like make a bite? Yeah. Anyway, no, <laughs> everything you said was beautiful. I just, I, I just want to um, make sure that that is, you know, reiterated in a way that like I understand I'm speaking to myself more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um if I can get more concrete for a moment sure. and, and less long-winded, two experiences um, of of gardening in in countries that that I've lived in. Um, back when I lived in Virginia, little apartment complex, I started like you know just expropriating some of like the lawn in front of the apartment complex to start a garden, mm-hmm. and I guess you know both um, tragically and like a bit of good fortune. Uh, like, you know, one of the the wage workers, you know, paid to like occasionally go by and do like lawn maintenance or whatever. Like it was just like days before I was about to harvest um, potatoes. Mm. And he's like, uh, I really wouldn't eat anything from here because once a year we, we got to come through here and like we, we, you know, throw down a bag of stuff that says like, you know, toxic, like yeah. you know, not, not fit for mm-hmm. human consumption. <laughs> um, and so then, so that's like an interesting way of, um, Oh crap! English. Um, what, 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 what's done with the commons historically? Um, breaking up in Catalan, it's like cerca. Oh, enclosures. Uh, yeah, yeah, enclo- Thank you, thank you. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, no worries. That, that's like, it's like a chemical enclosure. It's mm-hmm. like that's a way of like enclosing a commons that, mm-hmm. like, you know, they didn't even have to like you know send any like cops around or build any like hedgerows or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they they just put these horrible chemicals on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in large parts of the U.S there's like a very interesting fight against lawns and the culture of lawns. Mm -hmm. And I think a very, very interesting, like if you want to get like nerdy and strategic and like, you know, do like, you know, deep, deep dives and and like brainstorming Um, and an interesting question for like anarchists and other like, you know, actual anti-capitalists is how do we make the war against lawns uh, not just feed into middle-class homeowner activism of like, you know, mm-hmm. folks with a mortgage who have read Michael Pollan and are like, you know, oh, this is really interesting <laughs> and they're maybe sincere, but they they just have mm-hmm. no idea and they have enough structural privileges that they will never need to have any idea. So like, how do we like get into like reclaiming the commons of, because American cities are mostly built with a lot of cheap petroleum in mind. Mm-hmm. That's usually really bad because it means things are car dependent. It also means that American cities are much less dense. So most cities in the U.S., um, with huge, huge transformations to like how space is, is used and, you know, a whole lot of asphalt being ripped up and a whole lot of like bioremediation with fungi and, and, and whatnot um, could come closer to like food self-sufficiency, like, you know, within the limits of, of their territory. That's something that needs to be, yeah. uh, there's, you know, a lot of exceptions that need to be added there and whatnot it needs to be talked about in more detail, but like, like the struggle against, you know, lawns and whatnot, like could be like really, really interesting, but like, not yeah. if it's just like you know homeowners like you know having like food gardens instead right. of instead of something else. Another experience um, in Catalonia when I moved out of, of Barcelona, really a lot of interesting um, urban gardens uh, projects in Barcelona and like vacant lots. Um, but where I was living when I was like uh, an hour outside of Barcelona, like kind of more like a, a small town, um, we were expropriating uh, farmland right outside of our apartment complex. And it was land that had been farmed to death land that was like at the end of its productive cycle within like the capitalist mode of like throw a bunch of chemicals on it, Mm -hmm. right over it with a big industrial tractor um, Mm -hmm. a few times a year. And you, and in, in a bioregion that's, that's facing severe desertification, like it's going to become like a desert in like the wasteland sense. If like over the next few decades, people don't do like a lot of things to like, help um you know help the the ecosystem shift into something that can deal with with less rainfall in in a healthy Mm way Mm -hmm. um and so we were dealing with a really really impoverished compacted soil 
that was just it had just been farmed to death by capitalist farming practices which are like so in case anyone has missed the memo um, industrial agriculture has failed it is already a failed system yeah mm-hmm. um and so we we are in like the, a very very brief grace period when we need to figure out uh, other ways of, of feeding ourselves because industrial agriculture has already failed mm-hmm. um and so we were like doing things uh, you know like uh, like different gardening methods and whatnot and also like a lot of interspersing um uh, you know, trees, like, you know, fruit trees and nut trees and stuff like that with, with gardens. Um, there is a shepherd not too far away that like, we were like, you know, inviting him to to come. And that was great when like the sheep and the goats could, could come through because they were, if, you know, if pastoralism is, is done well and there's not too much market pressure and like too high a density, but like they can go through like the right rhythm, like, you know, mm-hmm. a couple times a year with lots of time in between for the fields to grow back. Um, pastoralism like flocks go, uh, goats and sheep they're like great great for um in not every bioregion but in many bioregions mm-hmm. for the fertility of the soil and the and, um, uh, diversity of you know the the flora uh, until like you know there's like some you know dickhead homeowner like nearby who like would complain uh about like you know the goats and the sheep sometimes like going like you know from the, the field that we have next to the apartment complex going over to his yard and that fucker is like out there every sunday with like a fucking weed whacker like what like do you just like do you hate yourself like do you do you like do you just dislike life so much that, i don't know i don't know what's wrong with people. it's okay I, I think many people relate to this feeling that you're expressing right you're like what the fuck okay. are you doing like why are you <laughs> like this <laughs> you, you have like you have sheep and goats that are cute that will come by and like do that for free without making noise and you don't have to be like in the sun on a Sunday with like a weed whacker. Yep. I just don't get it. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so like very, very different experiences of, of gardening. And so like, that's again, why like the sort of like simplistic macro global scale vision won't work because like what we have to do is so particular and it has to be adapted to, mm-hmm. to where we're living. Right. Right. Yeah. There's um, kind of ties into this question. I wanted to ask about the uh, rural urban divide. Um, and much of that is imposed. It's it's an artificial divide, um, but nonetheless, what I many people experience is that life in a city is very different from life in a rural area, whatever that is for you. Right? I've lived in rural areas my most of my life, um, coming from um, what is called Idaho, right? Southern Idaho. It's it's a high desert. It's largely most of the land is either public lands owned by the uh, BLM, like managed by BLM, or it's um, agriculture and dairies, right? Um, or, you know, living in a city has its own, I mean, it's traffic congestion, it's polluted, it's it's, it's awful for all, all these other reasons. But nonetheless, you know, what I was really taken by was, you know, you're not approaching this from like this sort of anti-civ, like we have to destroy cities and all this stuff. It's more of like people live in cities and cities are ecological spaces if we allow it to be. Um, and I want to talk about that because a lot of these struggles we're talking about are against, ex, you know, extractive industries, mining projects, you know, the building of dams, um, uh, uh, you know, oil extraction, you know, these things that are deforestation. There's so many different ways in which this is happening in what has been described as like the hinterlands, right? Yeah. But in the core, the capitalist core of cities, urban areas, um, there are also many different kinds of resistance uh, mm-hmm. forms of resistance that are uh, uh, happening um, that are ecological. And yeah. so I, I, I wanted to speak to that because, again, in this sort of post-capitalist future, where do urban environments fit in this? Where do mm-hmm. cities fit in this? Where do people go when cities are no longer the center of capitalist like accumulation, I guess? Yeah, um, yeah I would really like, if you could speak to that, please. Sure. Um, first, I want, I want to push back on, on one little thing. I think mm-hmm. there is like... Uh, like a lot to offer or like like a lot of interesting things in um, anti-civilizational anarchy if mm-hmm. what we mean by that is Freddie Perlman and not mm-hmm. you know some others who I don't need to name sure um, so yeah okay. not 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 a primitivist but um sure there, there are like some things that frame themselves as critiques of civilization that are that are worthwhile so I just sure. dropped up sure. right there but um, I think like the like the divide between like the urban rural divide is um, is something that we need to supersede, I think. I think it's an artifact of um, the capitalist organization of space, having sort of like different regimes for like organizing uh, industry, organizing accumulation and production, um, sort of like different modes that like need to coexist or like different strategies that can be applied to like one, one territory or another. And so like a lot of, a lot of city slickers, like 
they you know they think like the countryside and they they think it's like you know nature like untouched like like mm. nature is every bit as present in the cities uh as it is in the countryside not only in like a philosophical and, and true sense that it's like you know every place is an ecosystem and like the idea of like nature is something untouched is just like ahistorical and and ridiculous like mm-hmm. everywhere mm-hmm. there's life everywhere there's relationships between living things and so that's nature um, and also in the more tragic sense of how we're more aware, like the extent to which ecosystems have been like damaged and like asphalted over um, in the cities. And because most people these days live in urban or suburban environments and and because of like nature tourism, they tend to be less aware of, of the extent uh, to which industrialism has really, really wrecked. Uh, the countryside and has wrecked rural space. Um, mm. There's also um, there's also a lot of like romanticism around like farmers and like mm-hmm. there there are holdouts who are like repositories of like beautiful knowledge and beautiful traditions and actually like you know getting your hands dirty in the soil and like you know respect for all that. But like I hate to say it, like I'm you know I mean I some people tell me I come off as a judgmental person I don't know why but um uh like most farmers these days in industrialized countries are like horrible in the sense of like their relationship with like nature with the environment like 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 kinds of like relationships that they that they that they cultivate because they're technicians um they're they're technicians who Mm -hmm. apply chemicals and who run heavy machinery Mm-hmm. Um, just like you know, you would if if you're like a, a you know a manager or like you know a, a, like a, a technician in a huge factory. Like they're in a huge factory, but the huge factory is outside of the city and it doesn't have walls, and it's called mm-hmm. a farm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's no coincidence that a lot of like you know these farmers who are like you know the you know tied to a specific farm. So okay, the bank probably owns it, but like you know they're they're sort of you know, like the live-in managers or whatever, like how they systematically treat migrant laborers, like mostly racialized migrant laborers, that is no coincidence. And like the like the, the same sort of like hatred and disrespect and exploitation that they have towards racialized migrant laborers, they have that uh, towards the earth because the only people who could survive in the farming business as agriculture was increasingly industrialized and increasingly subjected to the capitalist need to extract profit, to extract value, were the ones who didn't mind um, treating the earth like a raw resource. So farms are also a factory, and and so we need to we need to break the urban rural divide because we need to understand that we are always in nature and we are always a part of nature, um, and we need to break the urban rural divide because it is a way that that capitalism um, organizes the exploitation of different territories. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one really interesting thing, and I was kind of imagining this when I imagined like, okay, let's say we have a revolution. How are we going to, how are we going to do that? So the first step was to imagine it where I was, where I was living. So like Barcelona, Catalonia, like more rural Catalonia. Um, because of course, you know, like don't trust anyone who thinks that they have like the answer for how everyone on the planet <laughs> in places that they've never even been to are going to deal with like a revolution or are going to deal with like the ecological crisis. So like Barcelona is a a quite dense city. So a lot of people would need to go out in the countryside, but like, are we imagining like a sort of like, you know, like Lyra Keith authoritarian environmentalism, like forced displacement? Like we've looked at the statistics and we've decided that 1 million of you must, you know, Mm -hmm. go and settle like the high Pyrenees and bring, you know, sustainable agriculture to this, you know, like not dense enough area. Like that's, that's absurd. And, you know, authoritarian would require a lot of police action and police require environmental exploitation and you know in order to be fed etc cetera, etc cetera. you just you know stay yeah. within that loop um a lot of a lot of folks there still have like some like you know basic memory or contact with like the villages because um, like capitalism has capitalism i think has been able to unfold itself in a more violent way in in settler states like north america and one of the results of that is greater alienation i was talking about this um with um with a close friend friend really recently about how like that insinuates itself into the culture so that people even like tend to prefer it or like think that it's like you know kind of like their their own choice um people in north america are like really really ephemeral with place and I think that's a problem. I don't have like a solution for like, you know, it needs to look like this, but I think like we can be confident in saying that like 
the relationship between most like non-indigenous and especially like like settler descended uh, North Americans to place is really really problematic. Um, mm -hmm. Not just in like you know feeling entitled to stolen indigenous land, but also in the sense of like you know just like moving around like you know this city's cool i'll go check out you know this place now like to not feeling like invested yeah. in like defending a place um or remembering a place and over there like capitalism um couldn't like unfold itself on top of like a genocide like to the same extent that that it could in like north america so there's like a little bit more memory and like um, even white people have like a little bit more in the way of roots and it's not like it's not something to romanticize it's not like mm -hmm. nearly like what it should be but like a little bit enough so that like a lot of people in the city like they have a little bit of connection to some place in the countryside like maybe their grandparents live still live there for mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. and it's like an interesting possibility of movement instead of someone being like entirely urban or entirely rural um and like moving beyond like the transformation of cities because like when you get rid of cars and you get rid of asphalt like you can grow a lot of food in cities but most cities still are not going to be able to be like completely um self-sufficient in terms of food but then on the other hand like you know those of us who have friends who have like these larger scale agricultural projects or these more ambitious agricultural projects with um with shepherding with like you know making olive oil doing grape harvests like you know bigger scale harvests they need help and they need a lot of help at specific times of the year Mm -hmm. So like when we have like connections because like our grandparents still live in that village or we have connections because, you know, our anarchist friends have um, like a big old olive orchard, uh, they don't need all of us, you know, hanging around, milling around like, you know, year round, but like a few times a year, like they need us to be there. And those of us who, you know, if we're staying in the city, we, <laughs> we need like more food than what we can grow on like, you know, what used to be the street mm -hmm. um, or on our rooftops. And so like a few times a year, like we can, like everyone is like kind of happier that way because like the people in the countryside have like a lot of help um, mm -hmm. in the times of year when they most need it. The people who are living in a more urban environment and who might culturally really, really like certain things about like, you know, the density of an urban environment mm -hmm. a few times a year can like, you know, get out in the countryside, you know, which, you know, they always love and like, you know, if sure. Instagram still existed in a post-revolutionary future, which I certainly <laughs> hope it doesn't, you know, they'd like, you know, fill up their Instagram with all the photos like, you know, our weekend in the countryside with the olive <laughs> trees and they come back with like really, really amazing and like healthy olive oil. Like it's like... Mm -hmm. People are like are no longer have to be one thing, but we can think of certain like migratory patterns that could be really healthy for us. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to do some kind of like Lyra Keith Pol Pot sort of like let's, you know, depopulate the cities and send everyone to like, you know, work camps in the countryside. And we also don't need to like ignore the fact that like um, cities as they've been built up under capitalism aren't sustainable and and can't really exist right. in the future. Right. So but like what if we're like we're actually all migratory animals like birds. And, you know, some of us are like, you know, more yeah. often in this place, some of us are more often in that place, but none of us are like entirely one thing or the other, but we're like a network that's always in movement that could work. Mm -hmm.